Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super excited to be talking about spiritual awakening through art. We have Samantha Stein joining us on the show. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. And hi to all of you. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Very excited for the show. We, was it the first time that we met at Lisa's birthday? May have been. Okay, I think that might have been the first time. And then again at the Seal Foundation's yeah. The Twelve screening, which was great. And also, Samantha Stein is a spiritual artist for her bio. <laughs> That's it. Nothing else. Super <laughs> short and succinct. And you can find the links in the bio below to the Instagram, the Twitter, as well as the website. All right. Let's, as we will be talking about all of these beautiful pieces of art throughout the show, let's start things off with what are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I think we live in very interesting times and we have more agency than ever to, to push the world in a positive or a negative direction or to choose how we feel that direction feels to us. So it's really interesting today as our environments become increasingly immersive that at the same exact time we're seeing you know, billion dollar valuations for mindfulness apps. And so I think that begs the question, why is that happening and why now? And I think the reason is, as Darwin says, the thing that makes us most fit for survival is adaptivity. And in these highly immersive environments where so much of what our environment exists to do is manipulate us, our biofeedback, our responses to things, what creates the greatest adaptive traits perhaps is the ability to control our, our minds and our biofeedback to these responses of environmental influence. So it's crazy times. I think the direction can be good when we really use mindfulness practices to feel like we're interconnected with all living beings and with one another so we feel that resonance and we can be more collaborative than ever which is when historically we see renaissance i think it can also create sort of this idea that oh if the world doesn't feel good to you that's your fault like you should be meditating more and then all of a sudden everything will feel fine and dandy which isn't the case and i think there's there's also a side of it that's quite problematic to create this narrative that if it starts with controlling your inner world to influence your outer world, that all of the responsibility is on you. When really, that's only part of the picture and it's a collective effort to create the world we wanna see. And I think, as always, we have all of the tools available to create a beautiful future and a beautiful here and now. Where do you think things went wrong along the journey? Where have things the, gone wrong? Of the civilization experiments that have occurred. So there's different ways to examine cultures and to examine societies. I think um, one paradigm that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I think many of us has, have as we're hearing all these headlines, capitalism's dead, capitalism is over, <laughs> like millennials hate capitalism, whatever it is, we've seen like hundreds of iterations now. Um, I think what these are really saying is that there's, there's two cultural paradigms that maybe we're most familiar with, which are a dominator paradigm where there's always hierarchical power and there, it's, it's fairly zero sum. I mean, I think we had like client patron relationships more in the past and now it's shifted more to completely a zero sum model in dominator cultures, which is why we're seeing you know, the environment just in to totally depleted with disregard. And then you also have collaborative environments where you see that people are working together in order to share resources and create a sense of abundance. And I think when we shift to dominator cultures and paradigms and we take that to its extreme, which another way to think about it is like a hedonistic extreme, the result is that we've taken a wrong term and there's many, many people suffering as a result of that. Not just people, you know, plants, animals, the earth is suffering. Many of the indigenous cultures point at our disconnection from source, from nature being the reason why we have so many of the ailments in our world. Do you align yourself with that feeling? Yeah, I think it's interesting that people can feel disconnected from their environments. I mean, I certainly feel that many times, right, that I'm I'm disconnected from groups of people or cultures or plants or animals. But then when you really sit and think about 
evolution, we're actually related to all of these things. Like these are these are by extension on a macro scale relatives. Yeah. Ancestrally. So yeah. depends how far back we want to go. And I think when you you really take a moment to think about what that means and think about the interconnectedness, it points out a really good point about where we've also gone wrong is where we've allowed abstractions to mask the interdependency of all things. <laughs> the interdependence of all things is something that we have the ability to tap into on a moment to moment basis. And we also have went in as far as to say that you can keep one foot in the world of everything's connected and one foot in the world of kind of like what's happening in the 3D physical reality ego stuff, just so that you can in a way try and co-create that future of the triangle moving to the circle, the hierarchy moving to the decentralized infrastructure. You said so many things. We find ourselves at this moment now. Some people say we went off of the Tao, we went off of the path. Other people say that, no, this is the path. It's supposed to be this damn hard. That's the point of the game, for it to be this hard. And you said that, you know, you, probably one of the most familiar ways of, view, of viewing what's going on in the world now is this, these $1 billion plus evaluations of mindfulness technology companies. Um, everything from the, uh, neurotechnology like uh, the brain sensing headband companies like Muse mm -hmm. and we've had Ariel on the show from her all the way to the calm app for for meditation or headspace so is this a is this a first order or first principle solution to what we need or is there something that's even deeper in our roots that is missing from our spiritual connection, all that is? Or is that a stepping stone to get there? I think it's important when we think about consciousness technology, which is going to be a bigger and bigger topic, and it's going to be something we see more and more venture capital flood into, that, like all technology, it's a tool, and all tools can be used for good or bad. And what I mean by that is that they can all be used to either serve humanity or harm humanity, actually, maybe create more extreme domination. I mean, if you, you push sort of that mind experiment to extreme, where we could invest in consciousness technology and tools for mind control of populations to subdue people and create really extreme hierarchies. So they can be used to bring people, in theory, much closer to a sense of of comp deep compassion and interconnectedness with all things, and they can be used to push them apart. Um, I think when we think about the mind and consciousness and meditation and the benefits we get from it, we often think about, there's actually this cartoon that I think sums it up perfectly. We think about how it can be a tool for sometimes um, creating a, a calm inner world or sometimes we think about it as like this makes me the most productive best version of myself and that latter version I think we're seeing more and more people tap into and my concern there is there's this great cartoon I saw where it's a monk sitting and meditating and then a guy in a suit who's like all you know pumped yeah. up and yeah, he yeah. looks like he's you yeah. know going to do some big important meeting or something and what his bubble says is, I meditate eight minutes a day so I can feel like I'm on top of the world. And the monk who's sitting there on the ground, his legs crossed, looks at him and says, if you meditated an hour a day, you wouldn't need to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. So I think these tools are tools that can be used for good and bad. I don't think that... I think the idea of um, short-circuiting feelings of that deepened compassion and interconnectedness could be a positive thing. I think it can all, these things can also be used in therapeutic context to, to heal people, which is really, really interesting. Yeah. And the advances in neuroscience there are quite promising. Um, there's a lot of people suffering from things like addiction or PTSD, and these tools are not just about, you know, a spiritual awakening, but they're also, um, have incredible applications for, well, how could you use them in medical contexts instead of using pharmacological interventions? Yep. 
It's so overall a positive thing, but something like any new technology or tool that you have to be mindful of how it's being used and safeguard it so that it's used in a way to support humanity. I like that. Yeah, safeguard the new tool deployments so that they can be used to as benevolent yeah, yeah. additions to humanity. I like that a lot. Okay, and this will continue coming up throughout our conversation. So let's jump into the art. We have this beautiful piece right here. I want to know, as you explain, you know, this piece is called Heart Resonance. Yeah. As you explain what your art is, how did you get interested in making art? For me, I needed... It was actually became something that just felt like a, I was meditating a lot and it, as an extension of that when I was creating art I realized that I was getting into the same sort of pe what people describe as a flow state where it's just like I would be working on a piece and hours and hours could pass and I just felt like in complete flow and uh, full of just joy and contentment and just deeply present in exactly what I was doing in that moment. And there's not many things in life I'd experienced that had given me that same sort of feeling. Yeah. And so, I mean, my parents actually both met in art school and both started okay. their careers as artists. <laughs> but as a reaction to that, I think in many ways, when I was younger, I wasn't very interested in art. I was interested in photography and even as a child won some awards for photographs I had taken. But painting or oil pastels or drawing or watercolors or painting, these other mediums I use today, um, I hadn't really taken an interest in at that time. And so it was more, more recently, especially within the last year, that I started getting especially interested in painting as a medium. And today, I'll share a bunch of my paintings with you. Wow. And then what's the heart resonance? I loved the, <laughs> we'll get to another one that I actually um, ended up just adoring a lot and this actually has it, car it carries the same style as the other one what is this how does this make you feel when you look at it ron how does it make you feel <laughs> it reminds me of my ex-wife <laughs> the colors are what her bridesmaids wore hmm. it's a lovely piece <laughs> Alan, how does it make you feel? And thank you for sharing. <laughs> so funny. This is like <laughs> a lot of a lot of your art to me is about creation, and I think uh, to me, really good art is about like origins uh, mm -hmm. or source. And um, in like immediately, uh, what came to me when I was uh, observing the other piece of art that has this very very similar style to it was that we are nerve endings of god yeah you know and so to me it's like these are all of the different expressions all the different nerve endings of source that are then out experiencing itself and then that's how we kind of get the interconnectedness and um yeah and then we become aware that we are that. And mm -hmm. then that's when like mother, like realizing itself. And then we kind of like go back to like ourself. And it's like, <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it is um, to me. What else, what about, yeah, what about you? That's beautiful. So I want my art to make people feel connected to their spirituality or make them feel like there's things they want to seek out and question in terms of that of feeling interconnected to all living beings and feeling a deepened sense of compassion for the world and for everything around them. You know, people keep talking about going to space. I really enjoy terrestrial life. So this is mostly a commentary on terrestrial life. How? And How? so- How, <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm mostly joking about that. This, this, art, more, this art's meant for you to ask yourself questions about your own spirituality and also, <laughs> Stay terrestrial, please. <laughs> well, it's just yeah. thinking about thinking about like yes, there's there's life beyond Earth, but staying connected to um, humanity and as an extension of that, all living beings as well. So this oh. is heart resonance. 
I've created other pieces which we'll take a look at, which are a similar theme where they're meant to make you have to focus the eye because there's a lot of movement in them through the gradient quality. Yeah. And I'm intentionally doing that because I want you to feel a bit disoriented and feel like, well, what feels calming and comfortable? And that's why you have red dots complemented by, by blue. And it's yeah. heart resonance because whereas my other pieces, the different faces are shaped like slightly different variations and directions, which feels like there's a lot of movement and forces the eye to steady more quickly. With this one, it's you can look at it and then slowly steady in on different focal points. And it's the feeling I have when, and I hope many of you have or are looking for or have you know, found time and time again, when you're surrounded by people who you don't even have to finish sentences for, to know that they understand you and your intentions and what, what you're trying to create in the world. You feel a deep sense of, of peace and comfort with that. Many people today refer to that as sort of your tribe. And how beautiful would it be if we really had a connection with all people, what we felt that sense of we're all yeah. part of this really grand tribe and we, we constantly are connected to that. And so that's what the resonance here is meant to represent. Yeah. We can lift it up maybe so they can yeah, see let's the bottom. Do that. So you can see. Yeah. So that one's heart resonance. The red also reminds me of the heart too. Yeah. 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 Put it down and maybe look at some of the other ones too. Let's do that. To have that warm feeling with everyone that is in the <laughs> tribe. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I mean, Ramdas had this quote Imagine if everyone was God in drag. And when you're sitting in a lift, you're doing whatever you're doing, going quickly throughout your day, and it's easy to sort of just like not be paying attention to people. But when you have that moment of presence with everyone you interact with, even if it's brief and just feeling connected, you can create that. And so it's, it was always something you said I really appreciated. Everyone as. Imagine everyone as God in drag. God and. God in drag. Oh, God in drag. Oh, yeah. oh okay, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Cool, cool. <laughs> I didn't know you were deaf, Alan. <laughs> It's also that that quote is also um, s speaks heavily to everyone being in their avatars or in their costumes mm -hmm. um, and then being able to kind of like switch up your costumes or your like yeah. avatars. But like remembering that it's a divine being. There's a piece later that I'm going to say some words about um, that we'll get to in a bit. OK, uh, next is we have images. We have us. We have we have. Wish me luck. We wish me luck. We, this, this is a spiritual material. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, this is, go ahead. Take, <laughs> take, us, take us through this journey. Well, what do, you, what do you see and feel when you look at this one? Ron? That one, I see a flower. I see a, a, a bee's stinger. Huh. I see... Um, the, co the earthy colors. I like it. I don't see my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> the colors of the bridesmaid dresses are not in yeah, this one. That's yeah. awful. <laughs> you know, Samantha, I love your work, and don't you know? My my role is devil's advocate, so <laughs> memory is a tricky thing. Yeah, yeah. We were just talking about conserve that or harm Paris us. Paris on the show that Ron was. <laughs> Just mentioning that. All right. You, even before you talked to me about it, there was uh, to, to me like sitting on now cushions for however many months it's been of my life that uh, I agree that it makes it immediately jump that there was like an essence of like a meditation happening. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't have enough time, I think, to look at it before you just were like, one of the heads is like super in the head meditation and the other one is melting into all that is. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. Yeah, so for this one, in the middle you have two people meditating and they're sitting with their backs towards one another. And in the final piece actually, which we'll see in a second, there's a white dot 
that the larger head is staring at. So the one is really focused in just meditating and becoming one with everything around him or her and just feeling connected to, to the ether itself. The other one, as they're meditating, their head, their ego, their self, it's, it's all about a dialectic with how great they are from meditating. Yeah. Like what a good <laughs> meditator they are. <laughs> like how much people need to know that they meditate, yeah. right? And yeah. so yeah. that one is, is sort of about these two choices you have with spirituality. Like for some people it can be a very private practice and it's very respectable. For other people, they really want to share that as a gift with others, which is really beautiful, can be really beautiful as well, as long as that, um, that desire to receive that is there, is, is there. But what we see a lot, a lot, is that you have so many people who kind of miss the point and are investing so much energy in their spiritual quest by saying like, oh, look how, look how great I am at meditating, or look how great I am at these different practices rather than using them to feel connected they're actually in that and even saying that like i've heard people say things as oh i'm so much more non dualistic than you which is like uh, wow well, <laughs> enough said you know i've learned a lot just by that phrase. phrase yeah yeah and i think we especially see that a lot in in silicon valley and what what that really says to me is that they're they're using it as a it's maybe coming from a place with fear where they're not ready to c truly connect to things greater than themselves or they really don't know how and so they're using these practices to once again replicate the version of themselves that already exists and that's what you see here whoa or even augment it yeah 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 the the, the yeah we were just a, cu a couple a couple days ago it was a very it was very late and we were um assisting um some of the the garbage team with um the back uh, and we were just assisting and, and afterward we were just talking about how it's what it, what matters is what you do when no one's looking yeah so if you're meditating for the purpose of your own divine actualization and, and yeah. transcendence um, versus to tweet about it afterward <laughs> post it, yeah etc go on a show telling the world about it. so much more non I know. you just than blew it, it. Hey, you that's did. okay you just that's Oh, I get it. Uh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it now. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah those acts of kindness, that type of stuff. Yeah, Ron's constantly giving um, young people or people that are that stop. Need the attention. Don't talk. Don't yeah. brag about my kindness and generosity. <laughs> Lie. Tell them I'm a miserable bastard, like I appear <laughs> to be anyway. I don't want to help anyone. <laughs> Let him drown. <laughs> Let's go to the next, uh, the next image. Oh, okay. So there's a couple in this, um, around this. This is a close-up. Yeah, so this is just a close-up to give you a better sense of kind of the detailing um, at the center of this piece. It's quite a large piece. I actually don't remember the dimensions, but it's probably about three times the size of this one. Wider than this one and taller? Um, it's probably three times the size wide. Wow. Yeah. That's huge, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and next, next yeah. one? and the next one has the dot in it, the final. Yeah, so just to show that like, rather than trying to become one with source, the observation of source and interaction with it becomes that amplification. So that's why on the one side, it's you sort of like dissolve into the connection to source, and on the other side, you're observing it. And like, uh. your, your ego grows through that process. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, or sense like of self. I like that. Uh, this is just a a hat I did from the leftover paint from that piece. So oh, that yeah, it's, it's the hat. Yeah, it's so not a painting of a woman wearing a hat. <laughs> no, that, that woman's was, actually me. Painting. There is another painting I don't have a larger photo of know. behind me that I'm covering up. But yeah, yeah. So I've, I've just been making with after every single piece with the leftover gradients a hat, and then I'll cool. give it yeah. to someone who's done something recently that I feel is like just really connected to my heart love it all right and then let's show well, okay hold on this one is is this freedom yeah so through yeah. this you can see by scale that's me actually standing behind the piece and so you can see the size of um of the piece itself so this one's called freedom and it's it's sort of a nondescript being in a cloak and 
all the woven parts of their being are, once again, you have two themes of how they're being amplified. I think we all use our egos in different ways to proxy, and maybe even more so now that we live in a world where we have so many channels for communication more than ever, but communication itself is so compressed that people are quite um, reserved in in what they're actually saying and it's diluted down to a quick text message or a tweet and in that world like people show different parts of themselves in different contexts and environments quite easily and so there's very what you often see is that the ego is proxied into the professional self like the mother the daughter the brother the son whatever it may be the basketball player and that these identities for many people have become almost like self-contained. I mean, for me, I've never really shared with very many people um, that I create artwork or much about my work itself. So it's in many ways a commentary on that as well. And so what you see here is... That's all changed. <laughs> <laughs> Starting and so what you see is the, the shedding of all the different ways the ego has been proxied and sort of once again, letting the the self and the face that's connecting forward with the world connect to source and so it's becoming more amorphous and more that that white sort of um, color that is the the base for every color or the base for no color and then the the ego proxy I, I, I enjoyed that a lot so then the little compressions of our ego displayed as like little posts across social platforms right now yeah. and we take on the different yeah personas depending on how we feel maybe you yeah and <clears throat> how does this then relate to the ego proxy again yeah so the faces on the the back that sort of like triangle shape is a bunch of different faces that are extending outward yeah. and sort of the shedding of all the different egos that have been proxied before uh, so this part right here uh-huh shedding of yeah. it huh? and then the up is towards so that's the face that's like currently being projected forward to the world and so in this image it's it's actually in this final state choosing to become connected to source and more amorphous so through the connection the the way the face looks the shape of it matters less as it's as it's sort of being projected into the world it's amorphous it turns into that once again white color, which to me very much symbolizes source. Okay, so it's uh, yes, yeah, sh the shed the ego proxies join source. <laughs> you could tweet that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please so, uh, join the source. Join the source, yeah. Shed ego proxies. May the source, source be with us. May the source, the source be with you. Yeah, right, good, good. Oh, I'm so happy these are happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great, great. Okay. All right. Excellent. So that's freedom. And then next is brain falls. I really enjoyed this one, too. Yeah. So this one is about... Wait. Oh, yeah. What, do you, what does this one feel like Ron? to you? Yeah. I want to hear what Ron thinks. What's it you. feel like to me? Um, losing one's mind. Okay. Yeah. I'm losing myself. I'm going to... Or getting rid of baggage. Mm, yeah. So, it would, mm, that's good. How about the egregious amount oh, I of, up, sorry. <laughs> oops, there's two elements. <laughs> the two of them, ah! <laughs> the, 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 the egregious amount of noise that is now in our civilization and how yeah. it is cluttering our essence and how we so desperately need to empty that noise so that we can reconnect more deeply. Yeah, so, I mean, waterfalls are a beautiful thing, and maybe we can also embrace what here is brain falls, things falling. Did you say waterfalls? Yeah. Okay, cool, waterfalls and brain falls, yeah. Okay. Brain falls okay. being a beautiful thing where it's just sort ah. of like rippling out like a steady stream, you can say here's all, like if you're thinking of your mind as something that can only hold on to so many thoughts, or if you concentrate on certain thoughts, they become stronger and actually viscerally become stronger. So if you concentrate on things like love, like compassion-based meditation, you focus on things like love, and as a result, you feel happier. There's also psychological tests that show that 
if you don't have, if you have a dummy arm next to you, but in your field of sight, it looks like it's your arm, but it's a prosthetic and yeah. someone hits it, that you feel pain, yeah, yeah. right? And so that's, that's the way our mind works. So if we know our mind works this way, how do we wire it for being the best possible mind and for positivity? We have to focus on the positive things and get rid of all the things that no longer serve us and do that cleanse. Like some people do that through a daily meditative practice. Some people do that you know, every so often through all sorts of means. There's many wisdom traditions that people use. Um, I mean, Freud, who in many ways inadvertently invented modern capitalism, actually <laughs> helped, helped create also a, a therapeutic context in which some people choose to do that. I think this also speaks very deeply to the information technology era that we're in, the exponential technology era, because the clutter has increased the amount of humans propagating noise has increased, has the amount of humans propagating signal, why is it so buried right now, why is the truth being obfuscated, who is behind the obfuscation of the truth, we'll talk about that yeah. later, we're going to actually, let's talk about that now, <laughs> okay, we can talk about that now, let's talk about that now, <laughs> what is behind the obfuscation of the truth, does it feel like there's something at play on planet earth but beyond the 3D physical reality. So why is it ho so hard to find what truth means today? And, and is there something beyond the 3D reality that is making it difficult? Are we living in a 3D reality? <laughs> what do you um, think, what is the reality? Is I it think, 4D with time or 11D, what is it? I think um, in actuality, it's very hard I mean, back to even the simulation theory question, it's very hard to, um, to scientifically prove it one way or another. And so perhaps more interesting is how do we as a society decide what, what truth means? And I think when people say we're in a post-truth world, I think we're in a disconnected world. I think we connected everyone initially via the internet, and not everyone, there's many people who are still not connected technologically, but we, we connected a large portion of humanity promising this sort of you know, idea of that we would have resonance and that greatness would come from that collaboration. When in actuality, the way information was ranked and dispersed, it made people feel like polarizing views had greater weight than they do, much like a coalition government. And the result of this is having people feel like they don't know how to find the truth, they don't know what is, um, is truth, it's easy to spread misinformation. And when we think of how we construct reality um, and how we construct truth, what is considered one person being crazy or another person being in touch with reality is just the idea of consensus among people that this is truly what happened and this is truth and this is reality. And how do we create that consensus um, in a technical era today? I think there's many people working on that problem through different um, verification protocols for understanding the weight and the veracity and the source of information. I think we also offline, you know, in our day-to-day our -day world, are increasingly feel disconnected from even our neighbors. You know, there was a, like growing up, like we knew who all of our, I knew who all my neighbors were. We, I mean, I grew up in Minnesota, but we often left our doors unlocked. And I can't imagine doing that in San Francisco. I don't know who my neighbors are. I know a few of them in my building, but on the block, very few. And I think that's the experience for, for many people today, especially living in urban areas. And so when we think about what is truth, what is reality today, I think we're, we're collectively deciding that it's okay for our truth to be that we, we don't know one another and that we're disconnected and that we're okay feeling like there's not one certain truth or we want to complain about it but we don't want to, to work to create a different reality yet. And when the true appetite is to create a different reality because it becomes so necessary for survival, we will. What do you think? Yeah, the I'm, I'm, I feel you. I feel you too. I, I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. 
Yeah, it, re it resonates deeply hearing you talk about the amount of people that are that want to see a big code update with the world and putting in the hard work to make that happen. That's part of the grand game that we're in. And the verification protocols, I think, is an interesting way what the decentralization technologies are enabling us to do. I think having neologisms, new words that speak to things that are more spiritual um, and less material is a good mm -hmm. way to um, get us there as well. Having more variations of the word of love. Um, yeah. Yeah, all these types of things. Huh. Okay. And, but, but beyond the planet, are mm -hmm. there forces at play on the planet that are from beyond the planet? Do I believe in aliens? Is that where we're going? I think that, so if we look at the, the genetic variation between like the slight, the slight difference in genetic material and the great variance between a human and a banana or like a human and an ape, and we decide that we're not going to ever shift that upwards and think that there would be great variance in the other direction, that seems quite statistically improbable. So we go point whatever 5% more than our last iteration and then we're supposed to have variation then. That's the... Well, in general, there's with a very small, small difference in the composition of DNA, you have these tremendous differences and things from like between like humans and a banana or humans and an ape. But that's like one, that's 50% homology with the banana and like 99.5 or more with primates. Yeah, yeah. and so think about, um, so when you, when you look at the difference between us and apes, is it not presumptuous to think that there's nothing shifted upwards in variance? So that there's Upwards, nothing, meaning, meaning there's nothing that has variance shifted in the other direction, like 0.01% difference between humans and something else that is more intelligent or involved or exists in some other way. Like or that different all types of the other perception vehicles that exist on the planet that humans are not endowed with. Yeah, I think you can also, I mean, there's different ways to, to look at the question. I think we could also look at what other types of intelligence exist on Earth, like octopi. So if there's a book called Other Minds yeah, that talks, about okay, so it talks about. Yeah. But yes, teaches about this. Yeah, yeah, so Other Minds is a really interesting read that talks about how different forms of consciousness have evolved. And one of the forms they talk about is octopi and how they're highly intelligent and that they have um, a very evolved form of consciousness and that there's actually a lot about their minds we really don't understand, but there's reason to believe that they have, in many ways, intelligence that could be far superior to our own. And we've actually recently had, um, I've seen increasing coverage warning people from places like the World Economic Forum not to eat octopi because I, of I the- I quit. <laughs> because I did. Because of how smart they are, and also mm. the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, when it yeah, was released. Yeah, we just interviewed Philip Lowe, yeah. Oh, great, yeah. yeah. So it explicitly stated that octopi feel and are conscious, and so therefore we should not eat them. And there's, there's consequences to eating them. I mean, I think I okay. joked with you once about like octopilarity. Like, yeah, <laughs> eventually yeah. they're just gonna get fed up. <laughs> like, yeah. we're so afraid about singularity, but like the octopi are gonna be like, no yeah, more. Yeah, no more. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the moment has come when they dominate the land. Yeah, they were like, we were yeah. peaceful, we were peaceful. And then they make rockets. We needed it for survival, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay, so then out of all of the tiny uh, blip of perception that we have, that there's so much more that even octopi, dolphins, any other sort of mass clumps of fungi or redwood forests, the way that they communicate their mm -hmm. perception strategies and communication strategies are just in many ways can be superior to ours. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's cell phones are not that smart. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, s s well interesting. S <clears throat> There's still more to unpack about what's actually happening on planet Earth with you, but maybe we can, maybe we'll end up getting to that. Do you think there's a global ruling elite? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, 
I think there's definitely um, concentrations of power among different groups of people. I think it's hard to deny that today. We're going to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to come after us. Should one endeavor to join these groups of power? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what your goals are. I mean, if we're talking about it, moving to a collaborative context for a better you know, cultural paradigm that might be best fit for the survival of humanity, then that would fall more into the, the dominator paradigm. And so it depends what vision you want to see exist and which one you're trying to be mm. behind. Mm. S- s- could, could it be that one could endeavor in and help transition the triangle to the circle and help update the codes without uh, or in a way that is with the current um, dominators? Um, you know, I think a, a friend of mine put it best when he once said there was like a group of people I was sort of naturally shifting away, just like they were in a room and I felt that they represented values and things that I did not. And so I just naturally shifted away. And he commented on, he's like, you do this without even realizing it. Like when people, you know, you don't even always know beforehand, but when they represent these things that don't feel aligned with you, you naturally seem to like gravitate away from them. Yeah. And he, What's wrong with that? Yeah. <laughs> so what? And, Tell him and, yes, so. and he sort of just looked at me for a minute and said, they need us too. They. Who are they? Who are you? <laughs> and what are you doing here? What did you do with the monkeys? <laughs> so on a bell curve of, let's say, spiritual actualization and connectedness, interconnectedness, that if you are closer to the end where you are really melted into all that is, maybe your role is to identify people that are almost done with their pull-up into the field and help them. But if you go to people at the other tail of the bell curve or that are still in the middle, it can be really difficult. It'll be like moving a brick wall. Um, so there's, there, there's, I think, some nuance there, but I like that, that point. Also, you can do cool things like make art like this that then catalyzes people in positions of power to feel more um, spiritually awakened and interconnected. I like that. But who controls the global ruling elite? Is it not you, Alan? Is it not me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the reptilians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Anunnaki. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be interviewing all these really smart people and bringing them together from different, different backgrounds. I thought you had something to do with it. <laughs> oh, no, she's blowing our cover around. <laughs> yeah. I told you we were in trouble. <laughs> okay, let's go to the self-portrait. That's the next one. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's a lot to say about this one. Whew. And I've spoken about this on the show before. Actually, I don't think... Ron, what do you think about this one? Yeah. <sighs> I have nothing. It reminds me of a mannequin, upside down, with no head. And it, it is. It's got no head, that's his bum, and he's on a <laughs> platform, upside down. That's, that's, you can't fool me. Yeah. What about you, Alan? Well, I think that there was um, something to me that called me towards feeling about it the way that you were describing it um, to me. Because, um, you know, I, I, I especially have had a pretty good amount of mentors uh, in my life recently that have, and, and just divine connection to, to source has also catalyzed this in me. But to see humans as other divine beings, period. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is something that's potentially coming through humans that are acting as channels that are that are acting in maybe partially malevolent or partially benevolent ways and so um, this is not necessarily to always uh, go with the source of them because there could be something that someone is trying to potentially harm you with but m- most people are good I th- also I, I'm just I'm especially for men is to 
treat women like they are divine beings and to mm -hmm. make that something that is more of our essence. I am not perfect. I still have a proclivity to occasionally uh, look in a way that is not heart centric first and not divine being first. And then I catch myself and change myself to feel that way about it. And I immediately um, feel better. And the same issue happens with with pornography or other um, behavioral mechanisms that we're not even aware of that then train us to objectify further and to not respect the divinity uh, within women. And I actually, the most divine men I know are the ones that know how to co-create with women at mm. the peak of uh, creative potential. So yeah, give us yeah, the thoughts on this. Yeah, so this one I just titled Self-Portrait and it's about the feelings of being viewed through your gender and that being something that oh, instead sorry. of there's so many of us instead of feeling something that recognizes your beauty as a human instead objectifies you and sees you just as just as a body to be objectified and so in this in this sort of extreme um interpretation of that feeling you can see the woman is um, it's her back to the viewer, her hand, like her arms are crossed in front of her with her hand over her back shoulder. So it's a very sort of like guarded position. Her head's been cut off, so she can't speak. And her legs are, you know, caught in this cement block. And so she really has no mobility too. And so it's really just, um, that feeling that I think many, many people, not just women, can relate to, which is that, that feeling when someone, it's the opposite of feeling, you know, compassionate and connected to people. When they look at someone or treat them like you're just an object and you're voiceless and you don't have freedom of movement and you're just this thing that I'm viewing as whatever it means to me to transact across. These are very thought-provoking. <laughs> yeah, and, and th th see, this is completely different than um, the spiritual material, heart resonance, freedom. Yeah. Actually, maybe there's some synergies with the freedom, but I feel like the, that, these are, that these teach completely different ways of, there's, there's a similarity of that spiritual awakening, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so with this one, I think part of oh. the larger discussion is how do you... Sorry, yeah, let's you go can. to the next. Um, my bad. If we're talking about a Sorry. dominator versus a collaborative context, if we're still in a paradigm where, based on gender, we're objectifying people, or there's other reasons that people are objectified, but let's say if we're doing that based on gender and we can't co-create yeah. um, between or across genders, it's also highly, highly problematic. And so this represents a vision of of a complimentary piece I'm working on of like what it looks like too when there's just total freedom of expression. Yeah. And you're total seeing Total freedom of expression. And yeah. you're just seen yeah. completely as whatever the beauty is you're supposed to create in the world and you're seen for that first. Yeah. And so this is a piece I'm actually working on right now that I have not finished. Um, but this, this one's called cool. Womb Kind. Womb Kind. Yeah. Whoa. I love the the colors of what is the one of the most sacred, if not the most sacred space, which is the womb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. To come from that, especially men not having to um, carry children within them and grow them for nine months yeah 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 that for men <laughs> to connect deeper to that feeling um i think is very important and coming from that creation from their mother yeah yeah so this one is all about um our interconnectedness as humans we all have come from a womb and so you're exactly right it's the the colors that represent this um it also shows sort of the way these these women and faces are turned towards each other and they're connecting with one another. But then you also have the layered faces and when you actually turn this piece and rotate it in another direction, it's the minds are connected through the thoughts of the other women. So it's sort of the layered. Whoa. Yeah. Nice. 
advice, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I just pulled that off. So, <laughs> so quickly, too. Yeah. Interesting. So this is another way to view it. And in this one, the, the minds that gave birth to them are still influencing them. That's their, oh. their mental connection. Whoa. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> nice. Now, I, yeah. okay, I'm following... I'm following. So there will be a symmetry then of what we see on the right now with what will potentially be on the on the left. Yeah, so it's less about the symmetry itself. It's more that this is a face and this is a face yes. here. Yes. And yes. So. Yes. I meant with the other pieces that are not yet yeah. on the left. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as the what comes out of the womb is then also affecting within um, the Per place of creation that they came from, which is like their mother. Yeah, all of our minds are, are connected, connected in the same way that our existence is. And so you see that like these other faces are resonating with thoughts that were created by the, the women, the minds that gave birth to them. Yeah. Okay, and then we have heart arrhythmia is next, which is actually the the one that I was initially commenting yeah. on that I said was like nerve endings of God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that so it's flipped here. Okay. So you get quite an interesting viewpoint. So oh, it, is a cool view. It's, it is a cool, cool viewpoint. Oh, I see. I yeah. see. Hold on. <laughs> so it's cool because when you view the art this way, almost something a little bit different comes, yeah. comes at. How does this one make you feel? There was something a little bit more hierarchical and less heterarchical about it. I about this like. one? Uh, when it was flipped on its side. Oh, okay. Because then it almost looked like there was a, a dominator hmm. in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But here it looks much more hierarchical, decentralized. But also... Oh, you s oh I also see you, s you, you start <laughs> with uh, deeper shades uh, you start with the deeper colors, uh, darker colors, in that in the in the center of of the centers mm -hmm. on this one, on heart arrhythmia. But then on heart resonance, on heart resonance is this one's. Uh, it goes down. It goes it, it's a darker gradient as it goes down. Yeah. So these are lighter in the centers. It's all yeah. fluid. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It's all fluid. The. Yeah, so this is the one that you described as people are, it really, for you, you described it as being inspiring because it reminded you that people are almost like the nerve endings of source or yes. of God. Yes, And so all of their emotions and their being is, is connected to that and that you can see and feel that here. So these are sister paintings and heart resonance is supposed to be, both of them have these dots that are um, these focal points that draw the eye in when you're, viewing the painting to to steady your focus because if you stare at this long enough <laughs> it just it's, it looks like it's moving it's so busy and chaotic and you ne you need your eye to retreat to a certain focal point so you feel steady and it becomes less dizzying and the degree to which it's dizzying is amplified when everyone's kind of like in a different a different resonance they're not beating together to the same sort of the same sort of drum, they're not in resonance, they're not in vibration with one another. And all of that movement is quite chaotic and you're like looking for the dot almost as a place of retreat from it. And it's not a bad thing, but mm. it's arrhythmia in terms of the heart's not in sync and beating together. Everyone's doing their own thing. Mm. They're not collaborating. This would be more the dominator paradigm. And this other one, heart resonance, is that feeling that there are these huh. points of retreat visually for the eye and you can center on them but your, your, your focus isn't shifted to do that as sharply or as quickly because of the lack of, um, the lack of movement that is not in residence. So in this, all of the faces are equally distance apart. They're, oh. they're the same outline, whereas these are different faces, <laughs> different, different distances. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, some of the yeah. noses are different. The lips yeah. are different. Yeah, all the head it. shapes are different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, these are this, and these are the same. And those are uniform. These are uniform. Interesting. There's some that are making out on here. <laughs> Don't pretty, tell anyone. It's pretty hot. <laughs> yeah. That's, pretty hot. that's when. Yeah, that's love. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots of love. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then, and the next one is this watercolor sketch. You could, you could please explain to us your process 
of making the art? Yeah, so for the painting we viewed earlier called Freedom, this is the watercolor and sketch I did prior to, to map out what I was going to do. And so usually, I, I won't always use watercolors, but usually I'll kind of map out and draw out what, what I want to put on the canvas. And so for this one, um, I started playing with these gradients of blue and I didn't even know what I was trying to say at first when I was drawing it. And I often feel this way with, with art and creating it. It's like I create these, these drawings or these images and it's just like flowing out of me of these ways that I feel and I'm thinking about things and don't yet quite know how to digest them with words. Yes. And then often I look at it and I'm like start laughing or, <laughs> or sometimes feel sad because I'm like, oh, that's what, that's what I'm digesting. Mm. That's what this feels like and means. And then I'll spend, you know, the, the weeks or months that it takes to paint it to digesting and meditating sort of on that subject and how that feels. And it often also curates what I start reading about or diving more deeply into yeah. because I realize that my mind feels a need to digest that more and learn more about it. Yeah. Or my heart too. I try to keep them connected. Yes, yes. And then is this then, so once you start this process of kind of of, of channeling what is what is cooking up within you through you onto um, onto art is this usually um, sketched and then watercolor is that usually the process before you take it to canvas usually so a few of them um, like the self portrait and brain falls I didn't sketch or anything first I just went straight to the canvas Damn. and started painting them for for these ones and um, so for heart resonance and heart arrhythmia and spiritual material and freedom, all of those I sketched first and used watercolors first to get a sense for them. Yeah, womb kind, no, that was another one where I just went straight to Whoa, the canvas yeah. and just started painting. This also yeah, speaks to me, the um, heart resonance and heart arrhythmia speak to me about the... Um, about the interconnectedness of all of us, uh, uh, independent of the variable of our skin color. Yeah. Is another one that speaks to me about. And then, okay, what about um, is, let's, let's, let's jump to, is consciousness localized in our nervous system? Does it come from beyond this vehicle that we reside in? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, our mind, I, I think of more as like a TV, right? So we think of, many people think of their minds as consciousness as the same thing mapped onto one another. Whereas really our mind is just a TV taking in inputs from all of the, the data points and sensory stimulation around us and in really the entire world to project images. And the more we put ourselves in proximity to certain images, the more that's what we see and think of as reality in the world. And so, there's, there's power in viewing reality in such a way because you realize that, that nothing is permanent and that you can actually shift the things that you're consuming or thinking about or seeing to play different things on the TV channel or in your mind. And so, you know, there's people call it like super hippy dippy or woo woo to say things like, oh, such good vibes, good vibrations only. <laughs> but really in terms of like resonance theory, like that it actually like, in, it scientifically makes more and more sense. And it is important that things we're, we're digesting, especially in an age where there seems to be endless access to information with yeah. varying qualities of, of um, maybe truth to it, but the access point is there and you can digest endlessly. And so how do we make sure we're getting rid of things if we have too much in our mind? Or how do we make sure that we're focusing on things that we want to to comprise our consciousness. People probably do a really good job on the show of taking the questions that I ask them and then answering it in the way that they want to answer it. <laughs> and I'm just not like... Oh, that's just uh, media training. Yeah, it's just <laughs> media training. It's not what you want to hear. It's what we want to say. <laughs> you gave a fantastic answer. You just said... <laughs> <laughs> addressing the core part of it is like I'll, I'll address another part that I think is very interesting um, but that's a that's a really good way to, to put it um, to be vigilant of the inputs we take in and also that we can then potentially even tune into other channels 
I can tune into your channel or Ron's channel. I can tune into an animal's channel, the collective consciousness's channel. Can you really do a good job at continuing to, 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 to tap into those that are seemingly different from you, but that can you get there? Can you, can you do that to, to feel the, the, the different channels of source? Another good way to put it is if you are running a simulation, or if you are an, another species, can you potentially tune into what the human experiment is doing between the channels of the humans or between the channels of the, from behind their eyes? I like that. Okay, we already t we talked about this a little bit earlier. What, what are we gonna do with the future of the way that we tr treat things with value? Hmm. It doesn't seem like GDP cares much about human well-being or or creativity if if like if basically if you took this piece of art around heart resonance and you mm -hmm. said things and you and nobody in the world cared about it yeah and then we'd be like oh there's no value in it <laughs> or infinite value so in terms of sort of the way we're shifting understandings of value, I think it's important to root them in like, well, what is value? What is reality? We talked about earlier, which is just consensus that something is true and something exists. So by extension, um, one manifestation of our collective consciousness would be the realities that we agree, agree on in terms of governance. And right now we have people who are at the cutting edge if we talk about uh, governance in terms of monetary policy or in terms of how we transact or store or understand um, value who are working on things like distributed ledger technology and blockchain and crypto and especially in Silicon Valley we hear about these so often and in many ways it's overhyped and in many ways it's not we're just at the very beginning of, of what these technologies can do I think when we, you're talking about you know, dominator versus collaborator um, cultural contexts or financial contexts. What's very promising about the innovations for, for not all, but many of these new, let's say, system designs for, for money or for stores of value is that within them, you can create smart contracts or you can create, not in all of them, but in many of them, like Ethereum, you can create smart contracts, which allow us to um, you can think of it in one way, embed cultural values or social values or even a social welfare system perhaps into um, a monetary system or a governance system of value. We come from source in many ways to not participate in the social, political, economic machinery. We come to connect back to source and to experience life at its fullest. And I don't think the social, political, economic machinery does any of that. I think yeah. it's a big machine that sucks the beautiful planet in and churns it out into bullshit that is super unnecessary yeah, for people to connect What are you doing about it, punk? Yeah. So just some thoughts. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I hear you, but you know, bitching about it. That's yeah. acquiesce. It's not. It's not bitching. It's it's conversation about it, and yeah, then do something about it. Then. Well, I think well, one of we are slowly there's doing many something things we about can do. It. I mean, one thing you can do is raise awareness about that. That you know, this most of the world, most of consciousness, most of reality is just a bunch of stories. It's a bunch of stories that we're telling ourselves and we're telling each other and we're passing on generation to generation. Maybe we're even epigenetically encoding within ourselves to create um, survival traits and you know, adaptivity amongst our offspring. But amongst all of these stories, one we can start shifting is that you don't need to dominate to survive, that you can collaborate. You don't need to have climb up a corporate ladder necessarily and look for fame or look for self-love or look for happiness or look for tons of money there. Sure, maybe you'll find fame, maybe you'll find money. But if ultimately you're looking for love and happiness and you get to the top and you look down and you're like, why don't I still feel this? Where are those things if they weren't here? You see this, this narrative play out again and again, especially in Silicon Valley where I think a lot of creation 
not all, but a lot is fear-based. People feeling like they need to prove themselves. They need to create something for the sake of, of proving that they're valuable. When really what they're saying is that they don't love themselves yet. Because if they did, they'd realize they already are valuable. Yeah. Everyone's valuable. Or that they think that they need to, you know, people in our, our current system oftentimes think they need to accumulate capital to prove that they're worth something. And then you find that a lot of the wealthiest people are, are some of the most unhappy. And so really, where does this feeling of, of joy and love come from, if not from that? And I think we can educate people about that. I think we have power to do things in the consumer choices we make. I mean, we can choose to consume a bunch of things because we're buying into this story that if you have the latest iPhone or the nicest car or you live in a flashy apartment, that people will respect you and want to be your friend and that you'll be valuable. But if we choose to look at those choices and say, oh, well, those actually make me feel or be those things, does that embody the person I want to be in my values? If we, if we become more critical in that sense and encourage others to, then I think we're doing something with every choice we make. Yeah, your point on stories is, is massive. I love that. What's the most beautiful thing in the world? Love. A little bit more. Yeah, I mean, Einstein wrote this beautiful letter to his daughter. I don't know if you've ever read it. I um, so. It was recently given to the, the archives at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And it's a letter in which he describes a sense that the world is not really ready to hear about the most powerful energetic source known to humanity and that it's the only thing that has, that man won't be able to control, that has the ability to produce infinite light and energy, and that is always replenishable, and that this thing is love. And he actually talks in this letter about how love fits into all of his different theories, and that it's so important that his, his daughter recognizes that this is the most powerful energy source in the entire world. And so, I think we have an opportunity at every moment to tap into that, to tap into feeling love for ourselves, to tap into feeling love for others, love for, for art, love for whatever strikes a creative chord for us, a collaborative chord. Chinese food. It might be. Love for Chinese food. <laughs> that love is creation, and that love can also be seen as hydrogen and oxygen coming together to form water. It's not just love that's creation. Get over that. <laughs> The universe is very violent. Don't you know anything about tough love? It's not, you know, don't be, be careful. You'll get burned. And maybe you get burned and then you have to keep saying like, I'll get burned a little bit here and there to live a life and where- And then we're mindless zombies. <laughs> all dancing around the maypole in an ignorant bliss. <laughs> For the working for the alien with big uh, eyes and gray skin, and we all look alike. It, it may be, or yeah. it might be that. Yeah, they can take it. It might be that we feel closer and closer to people around us if we choose to, even though some people show us they they don't have the that maybe they've learned not to trust, or maybe they've been shown that they can get burned. But instead of treating everyone in the world like they're going to burn them or that they deserve distrust, to give them that chance. Because, I mean, do you want to leave a world where you're closed off from people and you can't trust them and you don't know who your neighbors are and you're, you're rooted in fear? Or do you want to get burned every so often but always assume the best and, and choose to be rooted in love? Let's get there together. Let's build that future. Yeah. Samantha, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. <laughs> I'm so appreciative of you coming on. Yeah, it's great to be thank here. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So happy we finally made it. Hopefully, hopefully for more of these epic conversations, as also the art progresses, yeah. it will be very fun to continue coming and talking about it. Wow, so many cool topics covered. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know mm -hmm. what you're thinking. 
Also, do check out the links in the bio and go and follow Samantha across Instagram, Twitter, her website, go and check that out. Have more conversations with your friends, your families, coworkers, people online about spiritual art and about spiritual awakening through art. Have more conversations about it. Also, shout out to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Yeah, Thank you very thanks, much, Ron. Thanks, thanks. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the spiritual leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them. Support Simulation. Help us continue growing the show and prospering. You can find our Patreon, Cryptocurrency, PayPal links in the bio below. Design cool merch and get paid. That's down there as well. And go and build the future. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Peace.